No? Okay. <laughs> Thank you very much again. <laughs> So we move on, and our next uh, speaker is Professor Elder Lilia Romero from the Universidad Nacional de Quilmes in Buenos Aires. Her title sounds like a movie title. <laughs> it is indeed. <laughs> Current preclinical nanomedical strategies against dengue and Chagas disease. Okay, thank you very much for your presentation. Good afternoon for everybody. And uh, uh, this will be a brief presentation telling you about uh, these uh, two diseases, dengue and Chagas, uh, how it works. It doesn't work. Is the red one? Okay, the red one, okay. Uh, dengue and Chagas disease. And also tell you about the last uh, preclinical developments <clears throat> that uh, offered nanomedical approaches in uh, therapeutics and prophylaxis. Uh, let's start by the dengue. Dengue, as you know, is a neglected disease. It is a mosquito borne viral uh, transmitted disease with an expanding geographical range. It is, the disease is produced by a virus uh, an RNA virus, a single strand. Uh, there are four serotypes of uh, this virus that uh, produce uh, more than 50 million infections uh, each year in nearly 100 countries in the tropical and subtropical areas. Uh, nearly 2.5 billion people are, are estimated to be as at risk. And uh, with dengue, the first infection is mild, uh, and it leads to a, a self-limiting uh, disease, the dengue fever. But in the second infection, uh, a sh small amount of the person uh, can develop uh, the most uh, serious diseases, uh, such as the dengue uh, hemorrhagic fever and the dengue shock syndrome. That's it, the, the thing with the dengue. Uh, the life cycle of the disease is very easy. Uh, an infected person with the uh, virus in its blood, is, it is bitten by a mosquito. The, mo the mosquito contains the parasite inside that incubates uh, between eight to 10 days. And then when the mosquito bites uh, a healthy person, uh, it transmits the, the virus. And within four to 14 days, uh, the person becomes sick. And the point is that there is not a specific antiviral treatment, there is not a vaccine, and neither a suitable animal model uh, that can mimic the dengue disease, especially the severe forms of the disease. So it's all a major issue. Also, the pathogenesis of the disease is uh, complex. It is unclear, but it is probably related with a cytokine storm in cases of the most severe forms of the disease. So that, that, that it is uh, the, the story with the dengue. And the nanomedicine up to the moment has not addressed seriously the problem of developing uh, some strategy against dengue. And there was only one uh, publication that was focused in developing uh, an attempt of a vaccine against dengue by using nanotechnology. And this was published by Brazilian researchers two years ago. They use uh, nanoparticles made of bovine serum albumin, uh, which absorb four serotypes of inactivated dengue virus. And with it enhance, it, they uh, immunize the mice. But you know that mice, they cannot be challenged by the dengue. Instead, it was used uh, to reveal if the immune response was suitable to protect the mice against the virus. Because in the immune response, a huge fraction of the antibodies can be not neutralizing. And this could lead to a worsening of the disease. So the antibodies which are being raised, they must have a neutralizing activity. And uh, the results that they found were as follows. 
in spite of having a high title of antibodies, the antibodies have not neutralizing activity. So the strategy failed, and here it ends the story between the dengue and nanotechnology. So there is a lot of work to do. Let's go into the Chagas. This is Chagas. It's a vector-borne transmitted uh, disease in the Americas. And in, in the Americas, there is an insect vector, which is a triatomine bug. We call it vinchuca in Argentina. In other countries, the name is different. That uh, carries the protozoa Trypanosoma cruzi. I have to tell you that this is a highly disabling and a chronic parasitic infection. It causes nearly 1,200 annual, uh, 12,000 uh, uh, annual death. The annual incidence is nearly 30,000 uh, persons, nearly half a million dalis, nearly 10 million people today infected by Chagas disease and uh, 100 at risk of infection. And up to nearly 10 years ago, this disease was thought to be uh, limited to the Americas, especially to Latin America, and strongly related with poverty and uh, only vector transmitted. Mm? This is the vinchuca, this is a triatomine, and it was always thought that this was the source of the disease living in the poor houses. But nowadays, this uh, disease has got a worldwide distribution, uh, and, the and the transmission is no longer depending on the vector. As you can see, one of the most uh, infected countries right now, it is United States because of the immigration. They have nearly one, one million persons infected today, and the the transmission of the disease, which is no longer dependent exclusively on the presence of the vector, can occur by different means. For instance, by consuming contaminated food, uh, by blood transfusions, if the blood is not going to be tested for the presence of the parasite, and it is not. Uh, the vertical transmission from the infected mother to the, newborn, uh, to the newborn is very, very important and also the transplant of the organs. Those are the ways that people get, become infected today. And recently, it has been established a very close comparison be between the people infected with HIV, especially at the beginnings, beginnings of the 80s, when there was not available a medication against HIV to become it a chronic infection and Chagas disease. You see? the new HIV of the Americas. And the life infection, the, the life cycle is very complex, but the most remarkable things I have to say here is uh, that after being transmitted by the feces uh, of the triatomine on the skin of the person, the parasite uh, becomes an extracellular form the tripomastigotes, and these tripomastigotes are the responsible for the clinical symptoms. But the clinical symptoms that you need to submit the person to a treatment only appear in less than 1% of the cases. So this is a silent disease. When you become sick, you do not know. When you have the parasite inside, you do not know it. And in those cases, the parasite hides inside the cells and becomes the intracellular form, which is known as amastigote. And these amastigotes, they colonize, uh, especially the cells of the organs of the, tracto, of the tracto gastrointestinal, uh, and also the heart. And in 30 to 40% of the cases, 20 or 30 years later, these persons they suddenly die, especially these ones, because of a reactivation of the silent disease. Um, so this is the main problem, and the current treatment cannot uh, cope with the intracellular forms of the parasites. And when the clinical symptoms appear, appear here, it is very late, because the damage caused by the denervation and the inflammation are irreversible. So there is only one drug which is used to treat uh, the Chagas disease. This is the 
uh, to uh, nitro imidazole benzidazol, which was produced formerly by Bayer and then uh, um, by a laboratory in Brazil. And of course, after a recent shortage because of the increased uh, prescription of the drug all around the world, the drug start to be produced, uh, both the active principle as well as the medicine by uh, um, a laboratory in Argentina. And as I told you before, the treatment is effective uh, on the acute phase of the disease, which is very, just a, it is a snapshot of the, of the disease. And it is effective against the extracellular form of the parasite, but uh, does not uh, exert any effect on the intracellular forms. And also the treatment fails in adults because in, uh, um, besides of being uh, long treatments, it takes months at high doses because the drug has got a very low permeability and does not uh, get easily into the cells. Uh, it is inefficient because of this against the intracellular form. It is very toxic uh, for the adults and this uh, leads to a discontinuation of the treatment. So it is very uh, important and very urgent to count on new ways of delivering uh, the benzidazole or to move to another drugs. And, and in this field, I will give you a brief landscape of what has been doing nanotechnology regarding prophylaxis and therapeutics of a Chagas disease that we have recently published here. Um, in the last five years, uh, the selected works I will tell you about uh, are as follows. Uh, the first one is the use of liposomal amphotericin B uh, against the Chagas disease in uh, acute and chronic models uh, of Chagas. And the results that were obtained said that the ambison was unable to cure, not even alone ambison, but also in combination with the benzidazole. And such a discouraging results are due to the fact that this ambisome was not um, injected in the right uh, pathway. Instead of being intravenously administered, it was intraperitoneally administered. And because of that, this uh, nanoparticulated formulation was unable to uh, target the uh, infected cells in the body. This is uh, another interesting approach where a natural product Lignofolide was loaded within sterically stabilized nanocapsules made of a polymer. Uh, in here, the researchers achieve, after intravenous administration in acute models, higher Q rates, uh, reduced parasitemia, increased survival as compared to lower doses of benzidazole. And in this case, this is a development of our research group. And in here we use uh, a hydrophilic derivative of the benzidazole, the etanidazole, which is a drug with a very mild activity against the Chagas disease. But once inside pH sensitive liposomes, it is taken up by infected cells, it undergoes um, an endocytic pathway, and the increased acidity leads to a phase transition of the bilayer of the liposomes that uh, ends up with a massive release of the drug in the cytoplasm where the mastigotes nests are lying. So after uh, um, injecting intravenously this uh, uh, liposome, we achieve a significant or complete elimination of the parasitemia with extremely low doses of this drug that in the free drug, in the free form, has almost not trypanocidal activity. And finally, I have to mention this, uh, the Verenice project. This is the result of a, this is a collaborative project of the European community from the Seven Framework Program, which is uh, started in uh, two years ago. And it is um, um, composed by several laboratories uh, from Europe, from France and Spain, and also from Brazil and Argentina. And it is intended to develop uh, better medicines, nanomedicines against the Chagas disease. But up to the moment, there are no, no any um, uh, news about what they are going to do, 
what type of drugs are going to use exactly, what type of nanoparticles, on by, by which kind of pathway it is going to be administered. And after two years, there was only one result published which is not related, not related with nanotechnology. It is only um, the information that in a clinical trial, uh, the use of a very promising in preclinical test, uh, posaconazole, failed to eliminate the Chagas disease in human patients. But there are, I repeat, no published results yet. Uh, what about the vaccines? From the point of view of vaccination, uh, counting on a preventive uh, vaccina, uh, even of moderate uh, protective efficacy, could be very cost effective against Chagas. And also, a therapeutic vaccina could improve the prognosis of these patients. So, our research group was the only. Uh, using nanotechnology capable of having good, good uh, results uh, in protecting mice against Chagas. And in this, in this work, we use archosomes, which are vesicles made of a natural product uh, that contain the antigens of uh, the parasites. And after immunizing the mice, uh, they were challenged with a lethal dose of Chagas. And the main results uh, were these ones we achieved 100% of survivals of the mice that were uh, previously immunized. Um, so on the basis of uh, these results and several others, uh, we decided to face uh, new prophylactic and therapeutic strategies uh, uh, employing nanotechnology. And based on previous, in previous results that use in different ways, different types of archosomes that could be administered uh, by parenteral roots in this work, by topical roots in this way, by the oral route in this way, which are unpublished results. And uh, I have to stress that the composition of the archosomes is different each way, and the components are very thermostable they cannot be hydrolyzed by acids. They cannot be attacked by enzymes. They cannot be oxidized. So on the basis of this, we have created, uh, we think that this is the first uh, attempt of creating a small startup based on nanotechnology in South America, aimed to the production of natural ligands and natural nanoparticles uh, extracted from um, extreme organisms, which are very cheap as well. I will not get into the economical issue, but this is the point. And briefly tell you about uh, this new nanoparticle that we have developed that consists in two parts, a surface which is decorated with a ligand for an increased uptake uh, by dendritic cells, and an inner part that contains an imidazokinoline, which is an agonist of the toll-like receptor 7. In this way, we will have a double stimulation of the dendritic cells uh, within the same nanoparticle, made with natural components. We have already tested many types and many ways that these uh, nanoparticles, when they are decorated with this ligand, it can be highly taken up as compared to the plain nanoparticles. And because of the increased uptake by dendritic cells, for instance, if it carries a given protein, uh, this increased uptake would lead to an increased presentation to the immune system. And we have also found that the increased delivery to the endocytic pathway, where it is the receptor of uh, total like uh, receptor 7, uh, uh, the result is an increased uh, production of uh, type 1 interference that lead to uh, an increased response TH1 type, which is the one that you need when you have to defeat intracellular parasites and virus. That's it. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for this comprehensive overview on dengue, what's going on on uh, Chagas, Chagas uh, vaccination and drugs. 
I must say you, you have really chosen <laughs> two of the toughest diseases out there <laughs> where there is hardly any, any tool yet. But on the other hand, there is a lot of room and that, uh, an enormous need Absolutely. that something has to be done. Yeah, exactly. Are there questions or comments? Thank you for the very interesting talk. Um, the particles you presented at the end, do they have potential to increase the intracellular uptake of benzenidazole, the Chagas drug? You said it doesn't enter the cells, but the immune modulating particles, you said they, they can enter cells more efficiently. So can they also act as a delivery system for the benzenidazole? delivery of what you want to put inside as long as it is a small molecule or you can either use it as an adjuvant if you put it a, a macromolecule such as a protein. Thank you. Thank you. Eh, bueno, una pregunta. One question. Yes, uh, I want to advance my gratitude for the presentation. Thank you. In my country, Venezuela, two years ago, we had acute Chagas uh, patients, cases. Yes, acute. In children. Uh, due to contamination of uh, juice, guayaba juice. Uh, many children were contaminated with that juice in the capital city. Some of them, they died because of cardiac problems. Yes, we had problems to um, buy the benzidinazole. Benzidinazole, that is the drug. And there was a drug that had very good results, which is an antiarrhythmic drug. That is exactly what Droneradona. <laughs> Droneradona. And it uh, granted us very good results. And uh, we hope that you will consider that drug for, a, for the design of drugs for acute cases in the future. Well, it was, I, we think uh, that it would be a good idea to do that. Uh, well, I don't know, you are a medical doctor, but as far as I know, the treatment in the acute cases has to be directed uh, against the elimination of the parasite instead of uh, to decrease the cardiac damage. Because if it is uh, an acute infection, the, the damage of the heart must not be present. No, the treatment uh, hits oh, the parasite. I, I didn't know that. But, but right. you know that, that it, if it worked, then you have to use it the way it is, because you don't need to, to go to more complicated or costly uh, attempts uh, if it's uh, something about uh, or neglected disease. If it works with a pill, it is okay, I think. One is a clinical trial, and, and clinical trials in Chagas are extremely, extremely uh, difficult to get the patients and then also to, to, to define the outcome of the treatment, you know. 
There are, there are no good, good measures, yeah, because the parasite you cannot find and you cannot take biopsies of the heart. So the, the biomarkers, uh, people are working on that, but biomarkers are currently not there. So it's not, it's not that easy. But the clinical study has to be done, you know. You cannot just use something in patients, isn't it? Well, as I told you before, I, I'm not a medical doctor, but I didn't know that the, uh, well, I didn't know that the parasite, in fact, I think that the parasite was not in the herd, in spite of being attacked, the parasite, by the medication. Is it right? Que el, el parasito no estaba en el corazón. Okay, so it was not in the herd. I don't know. Yeah. Okay, I think we should stop this discussion. I don't say it's not interesting, but uh, this is something for coffee break.